Uh, good evening, class, and welcome to what will be a brief lecture on health information technology and its role in the U.S. healthcare system. I need to let you know at the outset, this is the first time I've actually recorded this lecture, so please bear with me uh, as I go through it on that count. Let me first introduce myself. My name's Harry Martin. I am currently beyond the faculty appointment to San Jose State Health Science Department. Also an information systems manager at the Public Health Department for the Santa Clara County Health and Hospital System. And I've been working with them since 1999. I'll go over some of the projects I've supported there and I'll give you a little bit of, you know, the <clears throat> things that I've actually worked on. Uh, let me also talk about my educational background. I have a bachelor's in French and psychology from the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, and a master's degree from the Monterey Institute of International Studies, now known as Middlebury Institute of International Studies, uh, still in Monterey. That was in international policy studies. <clears throat> and I've also studied at the University of Denver, the Corbell School of International Studies, where I worked, among other things, on global health affairs and policy analysis. Uh, you'll notice from my educational background that I don't have any specific training uh, formally uh, in health information technology. And I want to go over that in the lecture and just uh, share with you how things have sort of uh, evolved with health information technology. And uh, part of the reason why I don't have that formal training and background is that it just has not been available until very recently, beginning actually with, well, coinc coincidentally with the election of Barack Obama in 2008, uh, with the High Tech Act of the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act, uh, and I will go into more detail with that, they set aside a lot of money for uh, training folks to do health information technology in the U.S., so just to review in reverse order, uh, most recently, I, as I mentioned, I currently work with the county public health department supporting uh, various health information systems there. The largest one right now is what I would call, what we call a biosurveillance system. And the software that it runs is called Essence. And that is a software system that monitors emergency room visits uh, and looks at chief complaints to detect syndromes that might lead to suspicious outbreak activity or something that our health officers would be interested in getting uh, advance notice on a public health emergency. Uh, that is the system that's been in place here in the county since 2003. Uh, it was initiated right after 2000, well, 9-11, uh, the terrorist attacks, and there was a bioterrorist element to that whole system. We are now looking at using that system for more things like chronic disease management and just surveillance in general uh, for the uh, public health department. Uh, prior to the biosurveillance uh, project with the county, uh, I also worked on a very exciting project uh, where we took a paper-based system and brought it all the way to being a web-based system, uh, and that involved an immunization registry. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with yellow cards still, the shot cards that you needed at least back then to, to get registered for school. Uh, now those are all, that's all electronically tracked. Uh, we started that project back in 1996, actually 
in conjunction with the community health partnership uh, community clinics. The county clinics and those clinics were pilot sites for the, the technology. And with that successful implementation locally, we then were able to leverage that uh, foundational experience for a regional project that involved 10 Bay Area counties doing the same thing uh, that became known as the Bay Area Regional Registry, linking uh, the public health departments of, of the Bay Area. Uh, 10 million people were covered in that. Uh, it's also wide coverage. That uh, system, again, you know, they had already gone to electronically based, but now we wanted to move it to a web-based system. And that was done in 2003, I believe. Uh, system was made available on the web. And today, uh, it is one of the main pillars of what, you know, the HHS and CMS have implemented meaningful use incentives. That is one of the ways that doctors and hospitals are uh, compensated for installing electronic health record systems. I'll get into more about that uh, further in a lecture, but it's important to, to remember here that here's a, a basic system, a component that grew into this uh, nationally uh, funded effort that has now become part and parcel of our national health information infrastructure. Um, we haven't quite made it across state lines yet, but that is the next wave. So that, that's one exciting project that I worked on uh, with the county. Um, now, prior to going to the county, this is very interesting, uh, I had worked with the mortgage industry uh, after I received my master's degree. Now, that, as it turns out, had a very important information technology component. At the time, they were doing all of their applications for mortgages on paper. And the, the software became available, and I worked with that company to, you know, computerize all of that loan processing. And you can just imagine how much efficiencies were gained there but I mention that because the same uh, technology and the same uh, uh, management practices for managing technology and working with people apply as well in the health field. Uh, you're basically taking well-known processes in the case of health that uh, impact people's lives uh, and uh, helping create efficiencies and also uh, improve outcomes. So in the case of health, we want to improve health outcomes. Health information technology has a big role to play there. And at the end of the lecture, I hope that you will understand how important that role is and some key parts that uh, where it can be leveraged. Um, so with that, let me move on into uh, the details of the talk. Okay, so what's on our agenda for today? Two things primarily. I'll do the lecture on health information technology and then review briefly the syllabus for the HIT course that's offered in our department in the fall of each year. Um, Excuse me while I get used to this uh, presentation mode here. There we go. Okay, goals for the talk. I will be giving a very high level overview just to give you an idea where HIT fits primarily in the US healthcare system uh, and also the role that it played in healthcare reform which, yeah, as you all know, started with the uh, inauguration in 2009 of 
Barack Obama when he made specific mention to the issue of uh, computerized health records. So here we are eight years later and I'll be updating you on the progress we've made in that period. Um, also talk about the needs for the HIT workforce. This is still an ongoing issue. There are not enough skilled folks out there to uh, work in the field. The Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology recently announced a new round of funding for training programs. Uh, and I'll provide separately links to, to get information on that. I think all of you should consider uh, pursuing some of that training uh, because everything you do now in healthcare has a technology component to it. And uh, it's becoming very sophisticated. All, of course, with the goal of improving health outcomes. Um, I'll also describe some of the core concepts uh, that you will need to know in the field of health information technology. So let's start by taking a look at just what is HIT anyway. When we talk about HIT, it's really part of a larger field biomedical and health informatics. And at a top level, that is a field that seeks the optimal use of information aided by technology to improve individual health, healthcare, public health, and biomedical research. Core thing to remember here that it's really about information and people. The technology is a very relative, well, it's a very small piece actually up against uh, those two factors. Uh, we are swimming in information now. There is just more information than we can actually manage. All of it useful. Uh, the challenge now is to find ways to put that information to good use. Um, a big piece of HIT is the people equation, and I'll talk more about that also during the uh, during the lecture. So technology is a small piece. A lot of the technology is there. It needs to be implemented and used by people. Um, so when we talk about HIT, it's really about the science behind the application of information technology uh, to healthcare. And we refer to its practitioners as informaticians. Once again, to emphasize the equation, the HIT equation, health slash people plus information and technology is HIT. Next, I will go into what I refer to in uh, the textbook for the course HS-174, adopted the scope model for health information technology, and show you, talk to you briefly about how that fits within the field. Uh, if you'll notice, at the core, of this model of concentric rings, we have HIT. Now, that is the broad concept. It encompasses everything. Building from that core infrastructure, which includes electronic health records, all the systems that collect information on health, moving out to managing those systems. So the HIT component would include uh, systems and management to form a base for all of these other layers. Um, it's important at the core to have well-managed systems because everything emanates from this core. If you, if you have a well-designed, well-implemented uh, electronic health record system, which is going to give you the information flows all the way up to research policy and public health that needs to be, be right at the core. And we get it right there. So there are actually systems in place that bring information back down to this level to improve that system, a learning type arrangement. In fact, the ultimate goal here, further out, uh, a couple, five years from now, we hope to have what is called a learning health system that takes information at all these levels and contributes to managing health on a global level. 
Uh, so for now, it's it's important to look at the different uh, layers and how that those processes all will work together. Systems and management, uh, basically managing, as it says, the systems that provide the information. And the next core out, inf health informatics. Uh, health informatics is a dynamic discipline, and there's lots of training available now uh, for that. It includes clinical and business domains and expertise. Uh, so you're looking at both what happens uh, in treatment and providing care, but also in managing the health care delivery system and public health systems. We look at there the interaction between knowledge and workers, well, knowledge workers and their computers, and developing new automated workflows. And this is where you get the sort of cohesion where you bring together teams of IT professionals who work with the informat informaticist to create advances and link, again, going back to the equation, computers, people, and processes. Uh, finally, from that core, you get out to data and analytics. Uh, a lot of times we, we're hearing a lot about what's called big data these days. Uh, still a very nebulous concept. It just means there's a lot of data that many people just well, don't know really what to do with it yet. Uh, so coming up with ways through the through health informatics to manage that is one of the, the challenges. So here we would have analysis of data that's stored in what we call data warehouses, just huge stores of, of information. Uh, business intelligence, clinical intelligence terms, you know, and what happens here is what we refer to as the secondary use of data. So down here, here we would have primary use where you're actually managing health, uh, primary readings, anything that's covered uh, by HIPAA, protected health information. But once that information is de-identified, it can be used uh, secondarily. Uh, that leads up to the outer layer uh, which is sort of the top layer and where we're headed uh, with meaningful use. I'll explain more about how that works momentarily. To research policy and public health. Now out here we have organizations, top level organizations, the WHO, the National Institutes of Medicine, you know, all of the public health departments, uh, policy mechanisms of you take, for example, in Santa Clara County right now, there's an, an initiative uh, to improve childhood health and well-being. Uh, so assessment was one of the big uh, challenges there. But all the information that was gathered uh, through the core systems here is now going to be applied to create policy to improve uh, the public health, well, for, for children particularly in our county. So next, let's talk a little bit about the benefits and why we engage with in health information technology implementation. Why are we spending effort and energy and resources on this? Uh, it's not a trivial point. Up until uh, five years ago, money was not being spent on health information technology in in our country, uh, hardly any physicians had electronic health records implemented in their offices. That is a completely different picture today. We see that nearly, well, between 90 and 100 percent of all physicians do have electronic health records. It took some prodding from the national level, the uh, federal health uh, dollars, uh, and I'll talk about some of the incentive you know, how much money was spent there to, to make it more acceptable to the physicians to implement because it, it was a cost benefit uh, calculation that prevented them from, from actually proceeding. But just to get back now to why we engaged in this expanded, expanded use of health information technology. Just to go over them, uh, they'll seem fairly obvious, but it's important to reiterate. 
So benefits for individual health care, of course, we want to improve quality of patient care. There's a real role for uh, health information technology there. Reduce medical errors. Uh, I think you all are aware of the, this problem. And going back to the Institutes of Medicine report, where I believe between 98,000 and 400,000 medical errors occur in our health system per year. So it's a, it's a problem. And uh, HIT, of course, can play a role there too. To reduce cost, we all know how much health care costs in our country, and we are not getting very good uh, outcomes. Uh, the, I'm not sure where we are with the numbers. The last, I'm sure we're headed towards between four and five trillion, which is a mind boggling number. So we definitely need uh, help there. Also increase administrative efficiencies, 15% uh, at least now of our healthcare dollars go for just on admin cost. Eliminate duplication of information gathering and testing. Uh, it's still the case that every time you go to a different provider, you have to start from scratch and provide information uh, about yourself. Promote care coordination. That's another big challenge and a place where a lot of uh, improvement can yield much better outcomes when you talk about chronic disease management. And when you look at the numbers of uh, providers that one patient with, you know, now it's not unusual to have more than one, two, three, four chronic conditions, they see dozens of different uh, providers within one single year for their care. So, and a lot of those providers do not, cannot exchange information uh, meaningfully. And of course, the final one is to expand access to affordable care. This is still an issue we face in our country. We make great strides with uh, the Affordable Care Act. So far, 20 million people or 20 more million people were insured. There still remain at least 20 million more who go without health insurance. So we want to provide access to them for affordable care. Now through these benefits, you see the, the triangle, quality, cost, and access. So we're doing HIT to address core issues that we all ready were addressing in public health. So HIT is really uh, a tool to achieve that. So those were the private benefits, private sector, if you will, uh, patient, the healthcare delivery system benefits. But we also see public sector benefits, uh, early detection of infectious disease, outbreaks, uh, and that happens through one of the systems that I uh, manage, syndromic surveillance, also tracking of chronic disease, and evaluation of healthcare, determine the value derived from collection of this de-identified data. If you can, uh, I mentioned earlier the childhood health assessment program in our county. A lot of that data now resides in electronic health record systems. The challenge is to get it out of those systems to the public health department so they can uh, use that data effectively to advise policymakers on how to spend dollars. Uh, in interventions. So the next few slides will give you a, a diagram overview of our system, our health system, for the public health perspective, but also from the delivery system perspective. So first one up is what I call the public health grid. And if you'll notice, you know, the main elements here, uh, See consumers, federal agencies, health information exchange, public health departments and first responders, and, and over here, providers. Now linking all of these various uh, individual entities together is the challenge. 
Um, and all this will lead in the end to uh, what I referred to earlier as the learning health system. <clears throat> and I'll go over some of these, uh, these individual components, but at a broad brush you see up here, health hospital systems, different hospital systems, commercial lab systems, they all need to exchange information. And these sort of connectors here refer to services standards that allow all of these different, very different systems to, to talk to each other in a meaningful way. Um, from another perspective, these are more of the, uh, you know, components. But again, you see some of the core ones, CDC, the FDA, USDA, and I don't see CMS on here, but they're certainly a big uh, player along with HHS. So that's a diagram overview of, of our system and the various components. Now let's talk a little bit about the history of health information technology in, in the U.S. <clears throat> Uh, we've actually been working on this for quite some time across very different administrations. George W. Bush back, well, in 2004, set the goal that in 10 years we would have electronic health records to ensure complete health care information available for most Americans no matter where it originates. So the, these are all still goals that drive us we'll see that uh, there were some real teeth and dollars associated with that goal uh, under the uh, ERA legislation called High Tech, the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health uh, Act, enacted in 2009 under Barack Obama. But with the Bush administration, they did issue what are called executive orders. Uh, first of all, it was very broad a com to formalize the commitment to achieve widespread use of electronic health records by 2014. But also, he was able to direct all the agencies under his control uh, to ensure that their programs and external contracts were implementing the standards that would allow for interoperability of electronic health record systems. It's important to remember executive orders are unilaterally uh, available to the president. He does not have to go to Congress as long as it applies only to the administrative functions you know, under the executive branch. Uh, we're seeing now uh, with the new president incoming that those can all be reversed uh, at the stroke of a pen without going to Congress. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens there. It does take some effort and there are consequences for undoing these things. So we just have to watch that situation. The next big uh, infusion or uh, political attention came under the Obama administration, still focusing on pushing forward uh, towards widespread use of electronic health technology, um, shortened to five years then in 2009, still that 2014 goal. Uh, at the time in 2008, we saw the, the Great Recession. We needed to spend dollars to bring our economy back around. And one of the uh, initiatives there was the High Tech Act. Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health as part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, and that set aside $30 billion in incentives for electronic health record adoption. It also gave direct grants to federal agencies. Uh, this was to be coordinated by an Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. Some of the other provisions in the legislation Comparative effectiveness research, NIH and other research funding, 
and broadband and other infrastructure funding. If you're going to implement electronic health record technology and uh, interoperability on a wide scale, you need to have the broadband to uh, support it, to reach all areas, rural included. And as you know, this is all commercially run now, so there's not much of an incentive for providers to go to those far reaching corners of our country. Uh, so there was money set aside for that. Comparative effectiveness research is, is an important area because it is where we learn what types of interventions work and what interventions do not really give us as much uh, return on our investments. And being able to collect that information electronically is a big advantage uh, for, for pushing that agenda forward. Again, the motivations, the quality, it's not as good as it should be. The Institutes of Medicine, 2000, there's, uh, now this is talking about deaths between 44 and 98,000 people actually die every year uh, back in 2000, the year 2000, and that number has not changed that much. Uh, those are all deaths that we hope to be able to prevent Costs, as I mentioned, are rising and information is, is inaccessible. It's locked up in paper or in silos uh, held by individual providers. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the workforce needs to be able to, well, needs to be adjusted to support uh, this new technology, its implementation and, and management. So back uh, when ERA was implemented, the High Tech Act, there was there were dollars specifically allocated for this. The needs at the time were estimated at 50,000 new workers would have, would be needed to implement the federal HIT agenda, uh, and that has all been done. I mean, we're now at at the point where those workers have by and large been trained, and for that. Wave. Notice the, the term implementation. This was really getting the electronic health records in place, going back to that core uh, of the, the model, electronic health records. So just getting everything in place was that first step. Now we're looking at interoperability, making things talk to each other, uh, the, the different silos. Back then, the ONC funded you know, $118 million. I was actually able to participate in some of that training. It was free at the time. Um, curriculum development centers, university training grants, and competency testing. So you, once you've trained folks, you need to be able to ensure that they are comp competent to manage the records, the <clears throat> electronic health record systems that are out there. Uh, and just, I believe it was earlier this year, a new round of funding was uh, announced by the ONC uh, for the upcoming fiscal year. And I myself have been able to take advantage of that. I've signed up for uh, a course to begin in public health informatics in February of next year. So the funding is there. And uh, as I mentioned, please try to avail yourselves of it. Just to reiterate, and this was driven home in a, you know, a report from the Institutes of Medicine some time ago, uh, modern health care professional must have con competency in informatics to provide patient-centered care. And that's the whole uh, movement now with health care delivery. We want to get the patient involved in, in their care because, well, just to illustrate, chronic disease management happens where the patient is. You have to be able to you know, not just see the patient three times a year, you have to be able to manage their diseases where they live. So getting involved with the patient, and there are lots of tools now, electronic-based tools that, that can help us with that. Um, some of the core elements there, we wanna look at evidence-based practice and apply quality improvement and use 
utilize informatics, take that information and, and put it to use to improve patient uh, care and health outcomes. So who is this HIT workforce? Primarily, uh, there, there are three groups and they go on a scale from, you know, the primarily IT focused uh, individuals with computer science or information systems backgrounds. And this is where things were up until about 10 years ago. There were so-called computer geeks in the basement of hospitals uh, building up these, these systems for health information management. Uh, the other group, well, health information management professionals, they focus on medical records. So these are not necessarily, these folks do not necessarily have computer skills, but they know the uh, subject matter. And then f finally, clinical informaticists. Uh, these are folks at a professional level who come from uh, healthcare backgrounds, um, MDs, nurses, etc. So today, when a, a project is implemented, you will have folks from all three of those uh, areas working together on the project. Uh, you know, if you take a use case, for example, the, the clinical informaticist knows uh, the ins and outs of what's needed uh, in the new system. The uh, health information management professionals know how records are stored, where the information is, is kept. And the IT folks translate the requirements into code. Uh, computer code that then is used to uh, build the systems. And they all work together uh, in a sort of symbiotic uh, relationship uh, to create the, uh, the outcome, the final product. So at a high level, what was the high-tech vision back in 2009? And I'll also show you where we are today on, on this, uh, this uh, graphic uh, depiction. The three main sort of areas we grouped together called get it, use it, and share it. So the implementation phase was the get it phase. Get the technology, get it implemented. Uh, now we're at the use it phase where you want to use that information to manage care, coordinated care, for instance. Uh, share the information across your uh, different systems to improve care. <clears throat> now down at the bottom, you see share it. When we talk about sharing information here, that's really focused on the public health and research <clears throat> and policy sectors to be able to share it with that outer core uh, layer. These are all of the different uh, programs that were implemented, regional extension centers, workforce training, uh, the incentives and penalties under CMS for uh, implementing electronic health records, state grants for health information exchange, and of course standards and certification framework uh, for ensuring that the technology meets standards as it is implemented, and a big component as well, and uh, concern is privacy and security, to make sure that all this information that is now being uh, loaded into the cloud uh, or on electronic systems otherwise is secure and uh, protected. So just to go, I'm going to go briefly through some of these slides. Uh, key distinctions here, electronic medical records, this is an older term now, it, you know, I mentioned the immunization registry, that would be an electronic medical record. It's really more for uh, uh, specific use uh, for diagnoses and treatment maintained by physicians. When we talk about electronic health records, that's more of a longitudinal full record of the patient. And again, those two records are maintained by the provider. They are your information maintained by the provider. They belong to the provider. They are responsible for keeping it secure and protected. Personal health records are sort of a new breed of, of health records. 
they are maintained by the patient and they are not they may connect with the provider but they're the the patient's own record of his health or her health they are not covered by HIPAA so when you maintain your own personal health record you are solely responsible responsible for keeping it secure and and protected uh, minor note there once your medical identity is stolen it is something that you can't cancel like you would a credit card uh, credit cards can be canceled medical identity theft is a big issue right now those uh, draw a lot of money on the black market uh, I'll leave it at that um, but that also brings up a, a big dilemma we face I mean with sharing all of this information there are huge gains to be uh, had but there's also danger and risk I mean have we gone too far are we sharing too much information uh, we that's a question that we have to keep in mind going forward and that's why privacy and security is a core part of, of this whole uh, high-tech uh, vision so just to go over also some of the organizations that are involved here two primarily and they are under the health and human services a part of the uh, federal government ONC the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology and CMS the Centers for Medicaid Medicare and Medicaid services <clears throat> the ONC is the principal federal entity charged with coordination of national efforts to implement uh, health information technology and electronic exchange of information CMS is the agency that is responsible for as I mentioned the incentives uh, so for implementing electronic health technology ONC defined how that technology should be implemented and set up the frameworks the standards CMS uh, is the agency that verified that it has been implemented correctly and uh, is being used meaningfully I mentioned some of these building blocks interoperability the ability to exchange information between two systems and for it to mean the same thing on either end uh, there are more than 900 electronic health record systems available out there at the moment and they all need to talk to each other and say the same thing about you know patient data uh, when it's exchanged so one of the when we exchange information that's called health information exchange that's more of the infrastructure that will allow the information to move between providers and these other uh, concepts clinical decision support computerized physician order entry and e-prescribing those mainly happen at the point of care e-prescribing is uh, well basically uh, physicians don't write on paper anymore they electronically transmit their orders to the pharmacy in a seamless fashion reduces error saves time saves time and also make sure that the patient you know helps ensure that they do actually fill the medication and adhere to to their therapy uh, so I want to say a few words about uh, meaningful use that is the program a formal program that was implemented under high tech where in financial incentives for what we call meaningful use of health information technology were awarded to providers in two categories eligible professionals those are doctors and physicians and and eligible hospitals uh, there were between 36 and 40 billion dollars awarded that money has all been spent by now primarily there's only one more year left uh, for uh, signing up for these incentives and again that was managed under the office of the national coordinator for HIT ONC uh, as I mentioned earlier ONC defines the criteria for the EHRs how they must work but also CMS uh, 
At the same time, CMS defines how they must be used. Uh, how are they being used in clinical practice? Um, so what, what is meaningful use of an electronic health record? Going back to those core components of healthcare delivery we mentioned earlier, we want to improve quality, safety, and efficiency. And there are specific measures that have been defined for measuring that. Uh, we want to be able to engage patients in their care. One big goal there is to just give patients a copy of their health information so they don't have to wait until the next time they visit, six months from now, to see that information again. Increase coordination of care, exchange key clinical information with other providers, improve health status of the population. Those are more public health goals. Uh, one example there is submit electronic data to immunization registries. And finally, again, ensure privacy and security uh, of that data. Three requirements uh, were laid out at the outset. The use of certified electronic health technology in a meaningful manner, that it should be used for health information exchange, and finally, the use of certified technology to submit information on clinical quality measures. Now, I've kind of beaten this meaningful use horse over and over again, but it, it's important to look at these three core requirements because they are still present there. And uh, these are fundamental building blocks at the core. Electronic health record technology is where the information is created and used. And then to exchange that information across different uh, platforms to uh, provide outcomes, not just for the individual patients, but more uh, population health levels. And those have pretty much been covered under the Meaningful Use Program. We're now moving into this next phase of clinical quality measures where physicians will actually be, well, providers will be compensated by CMS based on their performance. How well do they manage chronic diseases? Uh, so there, there are very specific measures that have been defined uh, to, to help us move in that direction. Um, so the timeline for all of this implementation, uh, we've now reached this, this sort of the end uh, of the timeline for meaningful use, and we're looking ahead to the next phase, which right now has been defined under a concept called MACRA. I won't talk about that further down. But here's the time frame. In 2009, we came up with the high-tech policies, how this was going to be implemented. 2012, stage one. Uh, was defined where you would capture and share data. 2015, stage two was defined with where you'd have advanced care with decision support. That is where we are now. Uh, 2017 and beyond is where you start moving into what we you know, call improved outcomes. Keep in mind that, that uh, model where we're moving from the core electronic health record systems out to uh, patient outcomes. It's following that same uh, framework. Just give an idea of how this worked in, in practice and what was involved. Uh, Medicare or Medicaid uh, would reimburse eligible professionals, providers up to $44,000 for implementing the electronic health record systems. And that was roughly equivalent to the cost, the financial cost, in hard dollars. It doesn't mention the you know, disruption to your practice and the cost of training. But again, it was just enough to get providers to do what they, for the most part, realized was a overall benefit to them and their practice. It was just enough to, to nudge them in that, in that direction. Eligible hospitals could receive up to you know, 17500 per bed uh, if they participated in the program. Again, that money has all pretty much been spent at this point, um, and I think we could say that that program has been a success because it has achieved widespread implementation of electronic health record uh, technology across the delivery system. 
So I'm going to go very quickly through the various stages that I mentioned earlier. Stage one, getting people on board, capture and share data. Um, 15 core measures, and some of those involve demographic data, just gathering demographics, vitals, problem list, e-prescribing, uh, Rx list, allergies, drug interaction checks, patient summaries, just very basic uh, information centered around patient care and uh, health care delivery. Stage two, raise the bar a bit, where you start moving into uh, some of those optional objectives in stage one now were uh, defined to be core issues. It focused on care coordination, uh, requiring, for instance, that the Rx, allergy, and problem lists be incorporated into the continuity of care record. So that was uh, a, a new concept taking them to the next level. Focusing on care management, labs, radiology orders, and also starting to look at patient engagement where a certain number of patients in your practice, I think it was very low bar, 5%, had to be able to view, download, and transmit uh, their history you, the physician would be able to send that to their uh, patients electronically. Stage three, which is where we are now, uh, improving quality, safety, and efficiency for better health outcomes, and looking at decision support for high priority conditions. And again, that gets back to this whole concept of uh, health informatics, where you take the data you've already accumulated and use it to improve uh, care delivery and systems, electronic health record systems uh, to provide for better outcomes. Patient access to self-management tools, being able to pull down your record, know exactly where you are with, with your uh, records, your, your uh, readings, uh, health measures, and getting into this whole concept of a patient-centered health information exchange where we're doing this based on what the, the patient needs uh, in order to manage their health. And of course, looking at improved population health. When uh, doctors, physicians are under a pay for, 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 pay for, for performance scheme, excuse me there, uh, the goal there is to improve population health overall. Uh, and that is one of the uh, goals that CMS has adopted for their reimbursement going forward. And so I mentioned earlier this whole concept called MACRA, and it stands for the Medicare and CHIP Reauthorization Act. CHIP is the childhood, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly what that is, but it's, it's a program that's in place now. It was reauthorized, focused on uh, childhood health and uh, so we're using that to move forward towards what's called a merit-based incentive payment system where reimbursements will be based on the ability to deliver you know, better quality lower costs and improve clinical practice and also to move towards what we call advanced care information these measures begin in 2017 and the payments Will be well the measures begin 2017 payments in 2019 and it's more of an opt-in approach where you will actually as a provider be paid more for producing better outcomes so one thing i want to mention real quickly also you know progress report every year the ONC is required to report to Congress the, the progress that's been made. Uh, this is the 2014 progress report. I bring that up because that is the target date that was set by both President Bush and President Obama for 2014. By that time, we had 92% of all eligible hospitals uh, with electronic health record systems, implemented certified technology under the incentive program, for professionals, doctors, and other providers, 
in that category 75 percent. Uh, those numbers now, I don't have them in front of me, but they're between 90 and 100 percent. Hospitals, I'm pretty sure, are more at the 96 uh, percent level. And this, these reports are all available online uh, for download. Uh, if you go out to the um, ONC website and see them. And these links in the presentation are hyperlinks that you can use to, to find that data. The ONC has developed and maintains what's called an hit.gov dashboard where you can go to get you know all the information very easily on you know where we are with with electronic health record implementation, HIT in general. Um, so I encourage you to, to go through some of these links and find out what's out there. We mentioned patient engagement. The blue button is one initiative that uh, was implemented earlier on in the process, and it allows veterans uh, and Medicare recipients to, by simply pressing a blue button, download their data uh, from electronic health record systems uh, for their own use. Uh, it comes back in a simple text file, keeping it simple, easy to share. It's human and machine readable. So next I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the HIT workforce and give you a, a, an idea of what uh, the compensation for health IT professionals is like out there. Uh, it's one of the fastest growing uh, job areas. Uh, so let me move forward with that and, and show you where we are. Okay, so here's uh, some of the national data. It's a little bit old, I believe, from 2014. But it shows you uh, the salary range from the different uh, job positions that are out there from a consulting company, which is the best paid. Uh, these are annual salaries. Uh, if you're even at the clinical level, it's uh, very well paid. Keep in mind, these are national numbers. These are not uh, our Bay Area numbers, so it'd be a lot higher here. Uh, so there's a broad range, and this data is all available on that uh, hit.gov uh, website. So I encourage you to you know, pursue this. Uh, training is available, and uh, employers will hire you based on that uh, knowledge because it needs to be implemented. Uh, I mean, they're ready to go. So now I want to say a few words about the HIT course that's offered in the fall of each year. So this course was uh, designed back in 2011, I believe, and we finally were able to first teach it in 2014, um, but it's now a, a required course for health admin uh, concentration. So what do we do in this course? Um, first thing, one of the goals is to outline the major milestones in the history of HIT in the U.S., including reform efforts that supported HIT growth going to identify, describe, and analyze the major settings, providers, actors, and funding mechanis excuse me, mechanisms for HIT in the U.S. I alluded to some of those earlier in, in the presentation. We go a little bit more in detail, well, actually a lot more in detail with those to give you a broader understanding. And we look at also the interplay of health information technology in our current health system and how it affects efficient delivery of health care and public health services, looking at the relationship to that system and how it compares with other health care systems in the world. Uh, as it turns out, the U.S. is a little behind, well, has been behind the curve. We've caught up in recent years uh, so that we now have a wide-scale implementation of electronic uh, health technology, health information technology. Uh, one thing we look at too is how does HIT 
contribute to addressing things that we're concerned about, such as disparities, health equity, and also look at the forces for change that are uh, poised for uh, intervening with population health, looking at primarily the big concern now with chronic disease management. Uh, and also, one thing that will happen in this course, you'll understand the motivations and incentives for enhancing the role of information technology in terms of its impact on the uh, triangle, quality, safety, cost, and accessibility, and also looking at security of information in both clinical and public health settings. And we'll look at the HIT workforce, its composition, and continued importance to successfully implementing health care reform. As part of the course, you'll actually do a take on a practical issue, uh, an HIT problem from a healthcare setting where you propose a solution from IT uh, components, a solution to improve that problem, to, sol to solve it. Uh, this is at a very basic level, just to give you an idea of how what we call use cases work in the uh, in the real world, so to speak, so that you're ready to, you'll know what that means when you get out there and actually participate in a in an implementation project. Um, so with that, I think I need to stand up because the lights just went out. But that this is also a good time to say thank you for letting me speak with you. I'm sorry I was not able to be there in person. I do hope that this was helpful for you, and uh, Dr. S. will be able to provide you my contact information if you, you know, want to get in touch with me or have questions. Again, thank you very much.